Guru Rinpoche is a very unique phenomenon. And um, for Bhutanese, not only we have a very special relationship with him because he was supposed to have visited here and left a lot of prints, footprints, back prints, all kinds of prints. So we have really celebrated places like Sengizong, Parutakchang, Bumthang. Then also, Guru Rinpoche um, had a sort of a romantic connection with Bhutan too. One of his uh, very beloved ladies, supposedly, from Bhutan. And we are kind, some of us are kind of proud of that. Memotashi Chidan, I think. Somewhere in Kutta. I think it is safe to say that there is not a single temple in Bhutan where Guru Rinpoche is not depicted. So you will see Guru Rinpoche in all kinds of forms. The domineering school or the tradition that is practiced in Bhutan, which is Nyingma and Kagyu, both revere and venerate um, Guru Rinpoche and has a deep Guru Rinpoche practice in the both tradition. Some may think that it is only Nyingma that practices Guru Rinpoche, but it is not really true. For instance, Kunchen Pema Karpo, one of the great uh, Dubukaju commentator, if you like, he's one of the great Tertun, so um, there's that. So there's paintings, frescoes, small tankas, big tankas, and then we have um, Techu, for instance, right? The 10th day, Guru Rinpoche day. And then we have Dupche, or the Domche, as how we pronounce, where highlight of the sort of the Domche festival is marked by the dance of Guru Rinpoche. So Guru Rinpoche is a very big deal. Um, and Guru Rinpoche also seemed to have a big um, sort of impact on, not only in this life, but for the Bhutanese mind, the, there's all that concept of Sangdopari, you know, copper colored mountain, which is what the follower of the Guru Rinpoche wishes to reborn, so to speak. That's where you be, the follower of the Guru Rinpoche wants to migrate for good. <clears throat> and um, I have to say, Guru Rinpoche has a very special appeal to even traditionally not a Buddhist countries. It's quite an amazing thing. Like when you, uh, me, uh, you know, like the European, American, many, um, those who may not necessarily have a lot of information on Buddhism, somehow many of them do have attraction to Guru Rinpoche. I don't know. There are all kinds of reasons for this, I'm sure. Um, f such as, you know, like the Shakyamuni Buddha, who actually 
is the sort of the ultimate boss of the Buddha Dharma, appears to be very serene and kind of very pure and monkish and so kind of very wild natured Croatians, English, German, I don't know, somehow they seem to be more attracted to Guru Rinpoche who sort of hangs around with like eight women, uh, rides tiger, uh, doesn't really say no to alcohol. So I guess, you know, even on this level, there's some sort of appeal of Guru Rinpoche to even those who are totally, you know, who, who has really nothing much to do with Buddhism. But anyway, so who is this Guru Rinpoche? Now the Guru, to begin to, to talk about this, I, I have to say a little bit about Guru. And I have to say, unfortunately, Guru, this term Guru is overly used and it's almost become a derogatory term, especially past maybe 30 years. The guru, the guru, the whole phenomena of guru is mad with all kinds of, you know, uh, not that favorable circumstance and uh, situation. You know, we live in this earth and it's not always perfect and many times Guru is the most lucrative business. So it ends up get, uh, you know, it and uh, it and it uh, sort of in ends up uh, becoming very uh, materialistic also. This has happened. And uh, but the, there's a something very deeper meaning about meaning uh, to meaning or not just the meaning the deeper sort of the world of guru. If you really, especially if you look into the tantric tradition. There's a very beautiful story, I think the Upanishad. If you have read Upanishad, you will know. Once there was a father and son, and this father told the son that he need to be, he, he need to become learned, you know, he, he need to learn, he need to, you know, study, he need to read, he need to be educated. So, father told the son that the, that the son must go and visit this great master who lives nearby. Really, really great guru. Okay. But, but before I get into this, I just want to say guru, Sanskrit term guru is loosely translated as a master or the teacher which is translated as Lama in the Choke. In Dzongka is Lam, right? And um, La, Ma. Ma is a negative word. La is above. So it's something to do with the peerless. Nothing above. Very precious, supposedly. Okay, anyway, going back to that story, so the father managed to send the son to this master and for years he studied everything that master could teach, he taught. And the son became so good. And after so many years the son returned to the father and the father upon seeing the son, of course, you know, there's a changed son, educated, very well versed, everything. But Son was, the father was very disappointed, very sad. And when f son said, 
you know, I did what you asked. And in fact, I actually learned everything that Master taught. And Master himself told me that he is equal to the Master as far as the knowledge is concerned. As, as far as there's anything to be teachable, I had been taught. And the father said, see, this is the problem. You have learned everything that is teachable. And therefore, you are not perfect. You go back. You have to have a guru who can teach you that cannot be taught. So then the son went back. Supposedly, the story is kind of long. The master said, well, why are you here? You know, I've taught everything, but I know. And the son said, well, my father said, that's the problem, that you taught me everything that is teachable. And I'm here to learn that cannot be taught. And then master sat for a long time and said, good. Now you go and bring something like 300 cows to the forest. And don't ever come back until these 300 cows become 1,000 cows. And I have nothing, that's it. And that's what the, what is called it, son did, supposedly. Anyway, to make the story very short, he spent so many years, you know, it takes a long time to, I guess, multiply cows into 1,000. So it took a long time, and anyway, there he was alone. Cows don't talk to him. He can't talk to cows. Forests, trees, mountains, you can't really communicate in our normal way. And then he learned something that cannot be learned. You know, Upanishad, you know, Hindu, Hindu, well, so-called Hinduism, you know, which I always have to stress, so-called Hinduism, because Hinduism is not, it's, you know, the word Hinduism is invented by British or the Abrahamic people. It's, there's, there's, there was never such thing as Hinduism. And anyway, for the sake of communication, uh, so-called Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism is really profound. And this is a very important, actually, to understand the allegory of this story. The sort of message of this story is really profound. And it actually has an influence to many of our nuances. For instance, you know, like we say, Lam Jeva Joge, you know, Je, 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 you know, Lakang Jeva Joges. J, gel. The gel, the word, the Chokhe gel, actually is a translation from the Sanskrit word darshan. Darshan means seeing. You know, you see. Seeing is so important than thinking and understanding. When you see, you see there's nothing Concealing, it's totally naked. It is totally direct. That is so important. And of course, down the line, it all gets, you know, it, it has now become a culture and a ritual, of course. You know, you go to Lam Jeva, you know, you need a Chanje. Uh, um, if um, Nathan is here, I shouldn't be talking this, but. You need chanje, you need, you know, offerings, kadas, you know, all of that. And, and I'm not against the ritual, by the way. Rituals are necessary, but down the line, you end up missing the point. The point is to see. But to see what? And this is, let us discuss this a little later. Uh, I don't want to get too sort of go astray, because I'm supposed to talk about Guru Rinpoche, right? So, Guru Rinpoche is like the embodiment, 
the quintessence of this guru. So from this context, guru is not really bound by gender, citizenship, color, shape, etc., etc. I mean, as we know, Guru Rinpoche, who came to Bumtang, who went to Parotakchang, well, wait a minute, the one who went to Parotakchang, now the historians may, you know, sort of attack me, so I, 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 I want to be a little bit careful here. One who went to, let's say, Sengizong, who was he? From the external point of view, he was a Pakistani. Do you know that? He was a Pakistani. He was, he, he was born in Swat. And description actually fits quite well. And even, I mean, this is really not a nice thing for me to think that way, but when you look at, when you see these Talibans, with their turban and with this broad shoulder, they're so handsome, and the beard, and they're just, the, you know, the, you know, sort of macho and just such a elegant. You know what I'm talking about? You know, the way they move. The, and also, it's, it's described in the, you know, like the, some of the texts, like this land. It's called Odiana, by the way. And now, of course, it's called, you know, I think like Afghanistan, Swat, Swat places. Um, the description of these places like with this all this power and pamo. Power. You know, power. What is power? Vir, you know, vir, power. Power is like courageous. Someone who really doesn't give a damn about things. You know, someone who kind of does things like you know a little bit more than the norm. And you you can say, you know, those Taliban fits the sort of, sort of the image, don't you think? <laughs> so, in a way, yes, Guru Rinpoche is a Taliban. I'm sure. <laughs> when we talk about Guru Rinpoche, then there are some fantastical sort of very, very, like over the top stuff that you will hear. For instance, like, he was born from the lotus, right? And that's like, what? And I'm, I'm telling you, there's many, even among the, you know, the Tibetan uh, Buddhism, there are a lot of, you know, like, especially new translations. And they, they actually really criticize these things, like saying that this is a complete joke, you know, this is like a disgrace to Buddhism, you know, like, be, you know, this is, first of all, Buddhism is very, very proud of being really, uh, not, uh, sort of not theistic, and so on and so forth. And here we are, we are talking about someone who is born in the lotus. And someone who never died. Now that is just scientifically not acceptable. Isn't it? So who is, who is this? And then also when you read the life of the Guru Rinpoche, it sounds like he has lived for 900 years or so on and so, on and so forth. It doesn't, doesn't really connect. And by the way, just as a footnote, even from the Nyingma tradition, there are, traditions, uh, there are traditions and there are methods such as Tsele Rangdul where it is um, clearly stated that Guru Rinpoche is not necessarily born in the lotus. It, he was a prince. Okay, so I just want to throw that in. Bec but I want to talk more about this lotus-born business. Because I'm sure m many of your friends, your intellectual friends have looked on you as what's wrong with you, you know, like you follow this guy who is born in, from a lotus. But this is very profound. Remember, I was talking about something that you're learning, something that cannot be taught. See, we are tr what we are trying to teach is something that cannot be taught. 
The only way to teach something that cannot be taught is by making this kind of completely like beyond our normal way of thinking like four plus four is eight. You have to go beyond that. And it is also very poetic actually, it's very poetic. The lotus represents in in the Hind, I mean the ancient Indian culture, lotus is very important symbolism. Lotus symbolizes well, to begin with, I mean, if you talk about analogy, lotus is beautiful, it's so, you know, nice to look at, and it's pristine, and it's so beautiful, but it's, it's born in the mud, yet it's not stained by the mud, so on and so forth, right? So, lotus actually here represents your devotion, your mind. The nature, absolute nature of your mind is even though you roam around yourself in the stained, defiled world, you roam around in the bar, you may be fighting Chang Jiji, you may be, you know, overdosing uh, here and there, you may be, you know, like, I don't know, you may be stealing, you may be lying, you may be, you know, with all of that, the absolute nature of your mind is as pure as lotus. And it's believed that when we say Guru Rinpoche is born in, from the lotus, the moment you have the devotion towards the Guru, that devotion is the blossoming of the lotus. And there, the Guru Rinpoche is there. It's not like, you know, sort of slow motion, the first the lotus is born, and then the slowly the petal comes out, and then, you know, like Guru Rinpoche sort of materializes. It's not like that. You understand? So it's, you know, you have to think. It's a very, very profound. So actually the concept of lotus born is a really, um, To a certain extent, the Shakya Muni Buddha, okay, Shakya Muni Buddha, who was born in Lumbini 2,500 years ago, was a prince who renounced the life, worldly life, that happened 2,500 years ago, and he's dead. I mean, I'm not using the honorific language here, but he's finished. You understand? So, in a way, very distant from us. And um, 2,500 years has gone ever since Buddha Shakyamuni came on this earth. And we are supposedly the follower of him and we are supposedly under, is doing what he said. And um, Indians, Indians have never been good at keeping record. They used to be very proud of that, by the way, but they've never really been good at keeping record, you know, like, they, you know, it's, it's all, so that's why most of the Indian ancient whatever, what has happened is all like a bit like a myth. So, so now how do we trust? How do we trust? I mean, suppose, like I whisper to one of you here, and then you whisper to the other, another whisper to another. By the time it reaches to the tenth, the information will be distorted. And here we are talking about 2,500 years and thousands of human and, and different nationalities, Sanskrit speaking, Pali speaking, Bhutanese speaking, you know, Tibetan speaking. And God only knows what has happened there. Some of them may be drunk. <laughs> Some of them may be, <laughs> you know, like, we don't know. So, this is where the concept of guru 
Rinpoche, Lotus Bond is so special because here we are talking about the Buddha within. You don't travel back to 2,500 years. The moment Kangshik Mepaji, in fact, Guru Rinpoche, the historical Guru Rinpoche himself said, Tebach and Pejung Gonyal Yue, meaning those who have a devotion, I am sleeping right in front of your door. 